Uh, we're going to finish talking about the heart today uh, and maybe get started looking at uh, blood vessels. Um, where exactly did we stop last time? Hmm? Sorry? Say that again? Okay. Which is interesting because that question I heard you comparing, complaining about is basically from that question. Um, um, so, uh, um, actually, let me address one thing there. I think I heard you say you were done like 30 attempts on that. Um, for everybody's benefit, uh, when you're slamming your head against a wall trying to find an answer, um, before you get to 30 attempts on an assignment, please stop and ask for assistance. It's my job is to help you pass this class. So feel free to say, I've done this thing a few times and I really don't get what's going on. I'll give you some help, which might be, uh, <clears throat> oh, that material we haven't covered in class yet. We want to, I want to wait until we get to that. Or I might say, take a look at this picture here. So, um, <clears throat> Last time I described uh, um, preload, contractility, and afterload, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, and part of that, even we were, uh, <coughs> we saw the definition for cardiac output in sort of a mathematical uh, sense, which is heart rate times stroke volume. Um, stroke volume is regulated basically by, uh, well, there are a few other things that play into it, but the major things are uh, the preload, contractility, and afterload. Um, did I get around to saying that afterload isn't really something that we have control over? No. Okay, I see some nodding yeses, but then other people saying no. Um, so afterload, just to redefine that, is... Uh, essentially the blood pressure in the aorta, what the left ventricle has to pump against, and uh, we'll study the um, regulation of blood pressure in more depth when we get to the kidneys, but for the most part, that's not something that we tend to regulate very directly for the sake of cardiac output. Um, Blood pressure is regulated more in terms of kidney function. Blood pressure drives filtering blood through the kidneys. And so kidneys are kind of in charge of that. Um, and it's not that if your cardiac output suffers that the kidneys will say, oh, hey, we need to do something about that, other than the indirect effect it does have on filtering blood through the kidneys. Rather, um, <coughs> regulating stroke volume is more about uh, what we can do about preload and afterload. Um, I mean, sorry, preload and contractility. And um, having chronically high blood pressure is going to negatively affect cardiac output because of afterload. And it's just that your system adapts to chronic conditions like that. Um, it's not like the kidney knows that blood pressure is supposed to be 120 over 80 and always corrects for that, but rather if your body gets accustomed to 135 over 85 or something like that, um, then that's what your body starts to regulate to. That becomes the homeostatic set point for blood pressure. Um, and cardiac output suffers because of it, which is why high blood pressure is a risk factor for cardiac uh, disease because something like afterload we really don't have a mechanism to control for it. Um, so back to this picture. Um, this is not exactly anatomically correct so uh, I want to clear up some things that are implied by this but not in fact in fact true. Um, I kind of actually I can do this. 
Oh, no, I can't shoot. Um, I, what I was hoping to do was to put what I'm about to type on the board in the white space next to the uh, picture there, but I can't pull it off. So um, I'll flip back to that picture in a second. But um, so what this picture is showing us is the cardiovascular centers of the medulla, of which there are two, the cardio acceleratory oops, center and the cardio inhibitory inhibitor center. Um, so, uh, I'll give people a chance to write that down, and then we'll flip back to the picture. But in the medulla, there is a region of the gray matter that's responsible for controlling the cardiovascular center. And its functionality can be separated into two things, one increasing cardiac activity and the other one decreasing cardiac activity. So the cardioacceleratory center and a cardioinhibitory center. Um, <clears throat> So let me go back to this picture here. Um, again, this is not anatomically correct. Uh, what they're representing in here, not labeling. Um, these two yellow uh, parts of the figure are representing neurons, and they are uh, essentially the cardioacceleratory and cardioinhibitory centers. Um, What's not correct is that the, the cardiovascular centers are completely contained within the medulla. Um, so it wouldn't be a cell that projects out of the brainstem. Uh, instead, it depends on exactly what division of the autonomic system they're working on, exactly what they do. So the upper one there would be representing the cardioinhibitory center because it's connected to the uh, pink line, which is the vagus nerve, part of the parasympathetic system. The parasympathetic system will inhibit cardiac output. Um, so what's really happening is this neuron represented here in yellow is actually just projecting to another nucleus in the um, uh, brainstem. Uh, I think it's called the dorsal vagus nucleus or the dorsal, dorsal nucleus, sorry, dorsal nucleus of the vagus nerve or something like that. Um, it's basically the, the nucleus that's the output for the vagus nerve. And it's going to control uh, um, all sorts of things in the periphery <coughs> through the parasympathetic system. So this perp, uh, pink dot here that's the target of the yellow thing is not floating out uh, in front of the brainstem, but that's actually inside the brainstem. So uh, that the cell body's in the brainstem there, and its axon extends out as a fiber within the vagus nerve, which then synapses on the terminal ganglion near the heart, and that is then going to influence the heart. All that the parasympathetic system can do to the heart is decrease heart rate. And so uh, the two branches off the vagus nerve and the two postganglionic fibers that are connected to that are going to the SA node and the AV node. Um, not anatomically a great picture, but conceptually what they're saying is, is right on point. Um, and the problem here is where they put the endings going to the SA node and the AV node are not really quite correct for where they are in the heart, um, really they should be sort of up a little bit here. Uh, but for whatever reason, the artist uh, got a little bit wrong. It's fine. Uh, these two endings here, uh, one pink and one purple, are to the SA node, and these two, one pink and one purple, are to the AV node. That's what I had suggested. Because that's all that the parasympathetic system can do. It can slow down heart rate. It'll cause the SA node uh, to depolarize slower, um, not reach threshold with each pre-potential um, 
part of the, the exponential curve, um, and it'll get there slower. It doesn't really have to slow down the AV node, because the AV node on its own doesn't fire uh, faster than resting potential, but there's also input to the AV node, just slowing down all of the, the cardiac conduction pathway. Um, then the other part of this, the lower of the two yellow components in this picture would be the representing the cardioacceleratory center. And again, it's not a neuron in the brainstem that projects out in the periphery and synapses right in front of that. So that's just the way they've drawn it. Um, really what would happen there is that cell would project probably its axon would go from the medulla down into the spinal cord to the upper thoracic spinal cord region and synapse on uh, a neuron in the uh, sympathetic portion of the spinal cord. And then that neuron would send its uh, <clears throat> axon out to the sympathetic chain ganglion and actually go up to one of the cervical ganglia at the top. So it has to come out and go up in the chain ganglia. And then the neuron in that chain ganglion is the one that's depicted here. The postganglionic fiber, the one coming from the ganglion, uh, is what's indicated here as the sympathetic cardiac nerves. These are also sometimes just called the cardioacceleratory nerves. Because one thing they do, this branch, this first branch coming off of it, and the second branch, go to the SA node and the AV node um, also, and cause those cells to depolarize faster, getting them the prepotential uh, to reach threshold faster, and you get ash potentials firing off faster, speeding up the heart rate. And that's why it's called the cardioacceleratory center, the cardioacceleratory nerves, that speeds up the heart. But the third branch, so to speak, or the other branches here, are not going to the SA or AV node, but rather going to the um, wall of the uh, left ventricle. Um, there's probably a bit more extensive branching than this picture suggests. It's just not, not just three synapses there, but um, a whole uh, field of synapses that go to the cardio uh, ventricular wall of the left ventricle. And those synapses cause an increase in calcium entry into those cells, which is exactly what contractility is. So the parasympathetic system can only decrease heart rate, and that's the only effect it's going to have on um, cardiac output. The sympathetic side can I increase heart rate, which will increase cardiac output, but also will increase contractility, which will increase um, uh, stroke volume. So <clears throat> we can see two different aspects of how we control cardiac output. That's just about the cardiovascular centers um, of the medulla influencing uh, <clears throat> autonomic function. So let me just type that out a little bit more here. Um, let's see. This projects to uh, oops, thoracic spinal cord, not South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> Synapses on preganglionic uh, neuron. Preganglionic. Oops. In cervical uh, type of chain. Fiber uh, um, 
increases heart rate and contractility. Cardio inhibitory center um, projects to, I, again, I'm a little unsure about the actual name of this nucleus, but it's close. Uh, it's something like the dorsal nucleus of Vegas, something like that. Um, the ganglionic fiber and Vegas nerve uh, <coughs> synapses on terminal ganglion. Post ganglionic fiber decreases heart rate. So that's sort of a summary of what I said. Um, I mean, just make it a little smaller so that it doesn't break any lines and it's organized a bit better. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, the oh, actually I can. Actually, let me add one little thing here. Um, this Be explicit about that. So, cardio acceleratory center influences the sympathetic division uh, and Neurons in the medulla project down to the thoracic spinal cord, uh, synapsing on a preganglionic neuron. Then the preganglionic fiber uh, <clears throat> projects into the chain ganglia, and I put in parentheses cervical. Uh, that's where the uh, ganglionic neurons are that control cardiac function. Um, <clears throat> And the postganglionic fiber leaving that cervical ganglion, uh, which can be referred to as a cardioacceleratory nerve fiber, uh, increases heart rate at the SA or a AV node and increases contractility in the ventricular wall. And then the cardioinhibitory center influences pa the parasympathetic division. Uh, <clears throat> from that center, there's a very short projection to a neighboring nucleus, which again, I'm pretty sure is called the dorsal nucleus of vagus. Um, and the preganglionic fiber coming out of that nucleus, which is uh, now part of the vagus nerve, synapses on the terminal ganglion at the heart. Uh, and the postganglionic fiber decreases heart rate by uh, influencing SA and S uh, AV nodes. And that's all it does. So, little summary of what's going on there. Any questions? Okay. Um, if you didn't get to write all of that down, I am capturing this lecture so you can go back and see all of what I just wrote on the screen there uh, on the YouTube channel about 45 minutes after class today. Um, <coughs> Now, I want to point something out about this picture um, because there's an error in it. And the error that's in this is kind of in every uh, a and book that presents the same kind of information. The concept is fine, but there is an inherent error in what they're showing here. Um, in the online content for this chapter, I took this figure and I fixed it as best as I could um, to show what it's supposed to be. Um, this is essentially uh, the action potentials of the SA, uh, SA node. We looked at something kind of like this already where it defined the pre-potential uh, depolarization. We looked at that before. Um, the problem with this figure, and again, it's not really a problem with this book because it's a, an error that's in uh, similar figures in other books. And it's just all of the um, <clears throat> publishers, they kind of copy off each other more than uh, academics would like to admit. Um, and so they just propagate the problem throughout all of the textbooks for the most part. 
Um, similarly, uh, when I was showing you the picture of the pressure changes in the uh, heart, that aortic line that crosses over the ventricular pressure line in the wrong place, that's another problem that all textbooks tend to have. Um, <clears throat> only in the past year have I seen a couple of textbooks that have fixed that problem. But uh, So the same problem here. And it's really just um, what they're suggesting here. This is the normal activity of the SA node. It's not resting. Okay. Resting is when the SA node's been slowed down by the parasympathetic system. So this should just be normal, unaffected SA node fire. And then when the parasympathetic system has an effect on it, it slows down the depolarization. This is resting heart rate because that's the effect of parasympathetic system. Um, and then sympathetic stimulation is just the opposite of what the parasympathetic system does. So the, <clears throat> the real error here is that they're calling this resting. That's not resting heart rate. That's just uh, the regular SA firing. And then parasympathetic stimulation would be resting. Because of that um, point, the time scale here is wrong. So on the time scale here, we have from the uh, beginning of the graph to the same point before the second uh, action potential is 0 0.8 seconds, 800 milliseconds. That's resting heart rate. For the normal SA activity, that's not the right time scale. Okay. The um, sinoatrial node fires off at about 100 beats per minute. Um, and so we should see a different time scale representing that, which might be 0.6 seconds or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the uh, time scale really should be. And then down here, from the beginning of this to the beginning of the next one, that should be 0.8 because this is resting heart rate. Um, this picture really sums up why this is wrong. You would never have your parasympathetic system slow your heart rate down this much. This is like 40 beats per minute, maybe even less, uh, maybe like 30 beats per minute. No reason in normal physiology that you ever want your heart to slow down that much. That's bad for you. You're not getting blood around your body. So the parasympathetic system really should be slowing things down to resting heart rate. That's the point. The rested digestive effects it has on the heart. So this should be 800 milliseconds right here, not almost twice that. Um, the time scale down here isn't as important um, because it's just showing that things are speeding up. Um, although I, I would want it to be uh, depicting a faster heart rate, maybe 120 or 140 beats per minute, which I don't think this does. But if you ignore the time and that this is labeled resting, then what it's showing you is fine. Uh, if this is the rate that the SA node normally fires, the um, parasympathetic system hyperpolarizes these cells, so it takes them longer to reach threshold, and the action potential should slow down. And the sympathetic system uh, depolarizes the cells, pushes them closer to threshold, so that the prepotentials are very short, and you get quicker action potential. So the yellow line uh, showing the action potentials and the purple line showing sort of the, the bottom of them, that's all fine. Just ignore the time course, which I'm sure you probably would have anyways. But um, it's just <clears throat> this is what the SA node normally does. Parasympathetic slows it down by hyperpolarizing the cells, making it harder for them to get to the threshold. And the sympathetic system speeds it up by depolarizing the cells. Um, and getting them closer to the threshold. That's what the system is doing. And in the picture we were just looking at, uh, the cardio inhibitory center influence in the vagus nerve causes this, and the cardio acceleratory center through the um, sympathetic system influences this. Okay, so that's what this is showing. Just. The finer points I would have drawn here, what have been drawn here, are actually uh, incorrect. Because you would never actually see this slow of a heart rate 
uh, in normal function. Okay? That's, if your heart's beating that slow, there's a bigger problem going on. So, um, so in this area here, they're just uh, sort of explaining some of the things I've talked about. Um, the broken heart syndrome thing is kind of a weird little box that uh, um, <clears throat> essentially parasympathetic activity when it's abnormal can cause serious problems. But uh, it's a good sort of plot device in, you know, a lifetime movie or something like that, but it's not crucial for a and um, Here's where they define preload, contractility, and afterload. Ah, this is the picture I'm trying to get to. So this is sort of a summary of uh, what we've been talking about in terms of cardiac output. So uh, down here at the bottom, we have the mathematical definition that we've been working with, heart rate, stroke volume, which is the difference between EBV and ESV, and diastolic volume and systolic volume. The previous picture that introduced that um, under above heart rate, there was just a list of things that influence heart rate, and above stroke volume was a list of things that influence stroke volume. Now we're seeing a little bit more detail uh, addressing kind of all the things that we looked at. Um, <clears throat> hormones can increase or decrease heart rate, uh, like the thyroid hormones increase heart rate. Autonomic innervation can increase or decrease heart rate. Sympathetic increases, parasympathetic decreases. Um, there's something called the atrial reflex, which um, is a uh, autonomic reflex. When the atrial wall stretches out too much, stretch receptors uh, send a signal to the cardiovascular center, the cardio inhibitory part, and that slows down heart rate. Um, and heart rate and blood pressure are tied together. So the slower your heart beats, then the less pressure there is and there, the less stretch in the uh, atrial wall there will be. Interestingly, they put in the autonomic atrial reflex here, which uh, is a thing. They leave <coughs> out the fact that there's also a hormone-based atrial reflex. Um, when the um, atrial wall stretches out, stretch receptors will tell the cardio inhibitory center to do its thing. But also, the atrial wall releases hormones that um, have an effect. It's just those hormones don't have an effect on cardiac output the way that we're looking at it here. Instead, uh, the hormones cause, uh, let me think here, sodium excretion in the urine, which is also going to cause you to excrete more water, which is going to lower blood volume, and therefore blood pressure will go down. So. Uh, there's a hormone thing kind of built into that. Also, it just doesn't have a direct effect on the thing you're talking about in cardiac output. Um, or the way that it works in the cardiac output is just way more complex than this figure would allow for. Okay. So, um, hormones like thyroid hormone can increase heart rate. Other, I think, maybe glucagon can lower it. I can't remember. Uh, glucagon has an effect on heart rate too. I don't remember which way it goes. But, um, and we've talked about the autonomic effects there. Um, over on the stroke volume side, uh, if we want to affect stroke volume, we want to cha change either end diastolic volume or end systolic volume. Um, if end diastolic volume goes up relative to uh, end stroke uh, end systolic volume, then stroke volume is greater. Um, if end systolic volume goes down relative to end diastolic volume, stroke volume is greater. And then if they change in the other directions, stroke volume is less. Um, we can increase end diastolic volume through preload by stretching out the wall of the heart a little bit. It'll contract more um, and uh, get better stroke volume. We uh, stretch out the wall of the heart by putting more blood in there. So and diastolic volume is greater, and we get more stroke volume. But also the increase in contractility, not sorry, the <clears throat> increase in contraction, I don't want to use contractility because that's specifically something else. But the more contraction we get from preload will also potentially 
have an effect on its stomach volume, or at least more importantly, the difference between these two, and that'll affect stroke volume. We can <clears throat> increase preload, get more blood into the heart in two uh, basic ways, which are gonna sound very similar. Um, there's venous return, how much blood returns back to the heart through the veins, and there's filling time, how much blood, or how much time there is for blood to fill the heart. Now, when we say filling time, the blood that's being, that's coming in filling the heart is coming from the veins. The difference here is just how long do we allow blood to get in there, or can we get more blood back to the heart uh, than normal? Uh, when we talk about blood vessels, and that part of it will be next week, um, we'll learn that veins actually uh, have a reserve of blood. Um, we sort of store a little extra blood in our veins. The veins are uh, nice and wide, so there's lots of volume space for the volume of blood. And so we hang on to some blood there. It, it's in the veins more than it's elsewhere in the system. And when we need it quickly, we can send blood to the heart by uh, constricting the veins. Or we can uh, allow the heart to fill faster, or not fill faster, fill longer. Um, really, if you think about it, and this is one of the things that would be really hard to put into this picture, filling time is a matter of heart rate. If heart rate's slower, there, then there's more time between each beat. There's more time for blood to get into uh, the ventricle and fill it up, but that's just kind of what we represented here. But that's essentially what filling time is. Um, contractility specifically affects end systolic volume. Uh, the more calcium coming into the cell, uh, the myocardial cells, the more they can contract and the more blood they'll eject, which will lower end systolic volume. Contractility is only under the control of autonomic in intervention. The Cardio accelerotory center in the medulla will um, cause more calcium influx eventually at the heart through those uh, sympathetic fibers that end on the ventricular wall. Uh, there are hormones that can have a similar effect, and offhand I can't remember which ones they are. It might be thyroid hormones also. Um, and then afterload, uh, like I said, chronic high blood pressure is actually something we don't regulate that our body just gets used to having high blood pressure, so that can be a problem, but uh, it does have an effect on end systolic volume. If there is a um, acute change in blood pressure, your blood pressure drops suddenly or goes up suddenly, we can affect that um, through dilating or constricting the blood vessels and changing uh, blood pressure. Um, and so Ideally, we'll want the blood pressure to be normal so that there's not a huge effect of afterload on end systolic volume. But if your blood pressure is <coughs> too high, <coughs> excuse me, if your blood pressure is too high, then um, it's harder for the left ventricle to pump the blood into the aorta. Um, there's more pressure for uh, the left ventricle to overcome to even open up the aortic valve. And so there will be less time to eject blood and less blood to leave, and systolic volume will be higher. And for chronic conditions, there's really not much that can be done about that. But that's sort of an overview of all of the things that go into affecting cardiac output. Questions? Well, the last part you said if, uh, if uh, too high, it's harder for the left ventricle to pump. Right. So let me go back to a picture and illustrate this a little bit more. Um, oh. This will do. Um, so this is actually the picture of the cardiac conduction pathway. But all I want is to show you the ventricle uh, sending linear valve relationship. Now, to actually show you on the left side is a little tough because the aortic valve is kind of hidden there. So for the sake of 
what I want to explain, I'll use the right side, which technically this affects the right side too, but we're really mostly interested in the left side. Um, <clears throat> when the ventricle contracts, it's building up pressure, and that pressure is going to push through the um, semilunar valve. Um, the semilunar valve is closed because the blood that's in the artery uh, is sort of pushing back on the cusps and keeping the valve closed. And so the pressure that builds up in the ventricle has to be high enough to push that open. Okay. Now I am pointing at the right side of the heart on the picture here because it's more convenient for the way this is drawn, but let's pretend we're talking about the left side. So uh, the aortic valve and the aorta, let's pretend that's what I'm pointing at here. Um, the pressure in here should be uh, 80 uh, right before the, the valve is going to be open. If your blood pressure is higher than that, then um, when the heart contracts, it's got to build up more pressure to even push this open. And that's going to take up more of that ventricular systole time, and there will be less time for the actual ejection of blood because sort of like something's pushing back against the door and you can't open it up to get the blood out. Does that explain it? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Uh, cardiac cycle, cardiac physiology. Um, the last part of the chapter looks at development of the heart. Um, I don't usually touch on development. Actually, in this course, the only time I actually talk about any developmental processes is with the nervous system. Um, if you're interested in looking at the developmental heart stuff, feel free uh, to read through this in more depth. Uh, there is a concept coach part of this if you haven't already done that, but it's not something I'm going to stress in the of um, course at all. Uh, which brings us to the next chapter, which is blood vessels. So um, we'll go ahead and start talking about that now. Um, now, both lab groups have uh, um, had the vasculature lab where I showed the micrograph of a artery and a uh, vein slide by side, talked a little bit about the constancy of blood flow in and out of organs, um, and a uh, quick run through the anatomy of the system, uh, and then the blood pressure stuff. What we'll continue on, or what we'll do here with um, lectures, we'll uh, expand on some of that. Uh, <clears throat> this first picture um, is maybe a little silly uh, or simplistic, but um, I think it's a good place to set things up. Uh, we've already talked about, in terms of the heart, the uh, systemic and pulmonary circulation. Uh, so between the heart and the lungs is pulmonary circulation. Between the heart and the rest of the body is systemic circulation, which this is essentially showing us. Um, this is not at all anatomically correct. The lungs, of course, would be on either side of the heart, but they're trying to show a loop of circulation here and a loop of circulation here. When we get out into the systemic circulation, um, blood vessels are going throughout the whole body, and so they're just pointing out certain uh, major regions. Um, and arteries are coming, or the aorta, the major artery, is coming off of the left side and then uh, uh, it branches into smaller and smaller vessels, which are still arteries, and then smaller and smaller vessels yet that eventually lead to capillary beds, and then small vessels coming off of capillary beds feed into veins, which eventually come back to the right side of the heart. Um, so these um, little networks of vessels that we see in the middle here are capillary beds. The top one is just representing capillary beds of the upper body. That's going to be the head, neck, shoulders, um, arms, and uh, upper thoracic cavity. All of that's suggested by that. It's not a single capillary bed throughout all that area. There are multiple capillary beds all over the place, but um, they're just representing that as one aspect of uh, systemic circulation. Um, and then the lower body, they've separated out into a few other uh, regions. 
the very bottom is just the lower body, which is probably meant to suggest mostly the legs, but then also um, <clears throat> structures in the abdominal cavity, um, the lower <coughs> cavity, which aren't specifically mentioned elsewhere here. Um, <clears throat> They mention a few specific other things because it's important to consider uh, how circulation relief relates to those. So working from the bottom uh, up, the next one above the lower body part of the drawing is the uh, kidneys. And those are important because they filter blood. Um, we get waste products out of blood as it filters through the kidneys. So there's, they're highlighting a specific loop through that um, there's a specific artery that goes to the kidneys called the renal artery, and there's a specific vein that leaves the kidneys called the renal vein. Um, so that's kind of highlighted there. And then um, the next capillary bed that we see is the in, uh, stomach and intestines, so the digestive tract and the abdominal cavity. Um, and they're not naming specific artery is going to that because there's a bunch of different arteries going to it. It's a rather extensive uh, organ structure. Uh, but just collectively the capillaries there, which is where we're absorbing nutrients out of our food as well as supplying uh, oxygen and whatnot that the tissues of those organs need. Then leaving that capillary bed is a specific vein called the hepatic portal vein. And I mentioned that in lab, uh, sort of at the end of talking about the uh, artery and vein circulation maps in the chapter. Um, and that feeds into the liver, um, which is another li uh, loop here. Like the kidneys, the liver is going to be processing blood also. The kidneys are filtering waste out of the blood. The kidneys are filtering the blood also, but uh, not to remove things, but rather to modify what's going through there. Um, in lecture, I talked about the portal system and how the liver is important for uh, filtering out toxins that we might ingest, which is why we have that hepatic portal vein, so that things that we ingest and absorb into our bloodstream go through the kidney first. Um, Ideally, uh, any severely toxic molecules that we ingest are going to be uh, detoxified by the liver, but in actuality, depending on the dosage of toxic material we get, it might take a while for the blood as it passes through the liver over and over again to be completely detoxified. I use alcohol as an example there. Um, depending on the volume of alcohol you take in, it takes a while for the liver to completely remove that from circulation. Um, but uh, the liver also filters other things out of the blood. Um, it can play a somewhat minor role in immune function. There are white blood cells in the liver that can play a role, um, but more of that's taking place somewhere else, which we'll get to with the immune system, uh, which is actually the next chapter we're getting into. Um, and old red blood cells can be filtered out by the liver, and I mean, there's a number of different things. Um, so there's a loop of blood going through the liver, uh, providing oxygen to the liver tissue, but then also uh, things coming into the liver directly or through the digestive system get filtered out there. And handled. So uh, there's a few important loops in circulation that we want to kind of consider. Um, to some degree, we'll consider those loops a bit more in depth when we get to the uh, um, digestive system and uh, urinary system chapters. So. Okay. Um, this next picture is showing us the structure of blood vessels. Um, now, we're going to talk more about what all the different blood vessels are in more depth in a bit. At this point, they're just talking about arteries and veins, which are the two major blood vessels. Um, I've already mentioned that there are capillaries, which are different from this. We'll see how in a little bit. Um, and there are also a couple of other types of vessels, which we'll talk about too. 
but those other types of vessels kind of fit in with what we're talking about here. So whether it's an artery or a vein, and I can't quite fit everything on the screen here, um, the uh, wall of the blood vessel is um, organized into three layers of tissue. Those layers are called tunics. Uh, the word tunic in more common usage uh, usually is referring to a light coat or something like that. So it's a layer of clothing. Um, <clears throat> the tunics are just named. Uh, tunica externa means the outside layer. Tunica media is the middle layer. And then tunica intima, which I really wish was called the tunica interna. Yeah, interna, to be opposite of externa, but it's called the intima because it's intimately associated with the blood. It's the one that's right next to the blood. And a weird name. That's right. um, the tunica intima is um, sometimes also referred to as the endothelium, although it's more a little bit more than that. Um, the endothelium is this uh, simple squamous epithelium lining the blood vessels. It's continuous with the endocardium that lines the inside of the heart. And then it has associated connective tissue, which is, there's some uh, areolar connective tissue right next to it. Um, in arteries, uh, there's a little bit more to it. So over here, we can see the tunica intima of the vein, and there's uh, simple squamous epithelium, and then this light-colored patch next to it is the associated connective tissue, areolar connective tissue. We just see the same thing here, but in the areolar connective tissue layer, there's this squiggly line here, which is the internal elastic membrane. Um, that's elastic connective tissue, uh, dense elastic connective tissue in there. Basically, um, just a high density of elastic proteins, um, allowing for the uh, wall of the artery to stretch out a little bit and snap back to its original shape. We don't see elastic tissue in the vein. Um, because, oh, I'll get back to that in a second. Then the next layer, the tunica media, is pretty much smooth muscle. Um, and we see that in both uh, artery and vein. Now, in the artery, there's a little bit more to the tunica media in that it has an external elastic membrane also. The way that it's drawn and the way that it's labeled in the picture of the artery doesn't quite sync up, but I think it's just, it's a little vague exactly what's going on. So uh, the internal elastic membrane is represented by this squiggly purple line or whatever color that is. And the same color we see kind of squiggly lines going through the smooth muscle of the tunica media. But then the label for external elastic membrane is actually pointing at the outer edge of the tunica media. Um, and we see that same color kind of line there. So uh, in some ways, you'll see sources that say that the external elastic membrane is on the outside of the smooth muscle. And then also you can see some sources that talk about how the elastic fibers are kind of woven in with the smooth muscle. Um, In uh, my a &P one classes, and I can't quite remember how uh, that I addressed this last semester, but teaching a &P one right now, um, I know I am doing it. Uh, when we're studying tissues, we talk about dense elastic connective tissue, and I have my students look at a picture of the wall of the aorta, um, which is stained for elastic fibers. And the elastic fibers really are integrated in with uh, what seems to be the the smooth muscle layers of tissue. Um, so the way it's drawn here suggests that the elastic fibers are kind of all through this. Uh, but the labeling, which is consistent with a lot of other textbooks, puts the uh, layer on the outside edge of the tube. Um, it's just more elastic fibers giving the uh, artery the ability to stretch and return to a three. Okay. Uh, another representation, another book that I've seen that really sort of stresses it being on the outside, uh, makes a good point that the inside and the outside of the muscle layer is basically uh, elastic tissue. So the muscle can contract uh, as needed, and then the elastic fibers 
can stretch as needed, allowing the vessels to go sort of either direction. Okay, so don't worry too much of exactly where the fibers are, but in the tunica media there are elastic fibers. And then the outermost part is called the tunica externa, which is really just loose connective tissue that holds the um, blood vessel in place. Um, other organs will have an outer layer that's a membrane, uh, epithelium and uh, other tissues, that sort of define its outer edge. But uh, blood vessels that just sort of connective tissue anchors the blood vessel in place and kind of blends into the surrounding tissue. Now in here there's a label on this thing here that says Vasa Vasorum and this thing here that says Nervi Vasorum. Um, in the larger blood vessels, and this is true of arteries and veins, in the larger <laughs> blood vessels, the thickness of the wall is so great that tissues towards the outer part are too far away from the blood supply to get nutrients or get rid of waste. So there are small blood vessels in the outer wall of large blood vessels, which are called vasovasorum or vasovasorum. So there are blood vessels of the blood vessel, just little blood vessels su supplying uh, nutrients and whatnot to the outside uh, extent of really thick blood vessels. And then the nervi vasorum uh, aren't reserved just for really big arteries or blood vessels, but uh, um, are probably going to be present in most of them. That's the nervous tissue connection to the blood vessels. Now, what is nervous tissue going to do for blood vessels? What effect does your nervous system have on blood vessels? <laughs> right. It'll cause the smooth muscle to contract, which is going to constrict the blood vessel. So what part of your nervous system causes that to happen? Yeah, sympathetic. The nervi vasorum fibers there are pretty much postganglionic sympathetic fibers. Um, for the most part, the parasympathetic system doesn't have any effect on blood vessels, but there are some situations where that is possible, that is present. Um, when there are postganglionic parasympathetic fibers uh, in the wall of blood vessels, they'll cause vasodilation, except that you can't actually tell muscle to relax and actively dilate something. Muscle can only contract. Um, and so uh, any signal that's going to cause vasodilation is actually going to cause um, cells in the blood vessel, and I'm pretty sure it's endothelial cells, to release a hormone-like signal called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide will um, cause vasodilation. Um, does anybody know the name of a common, commonly advertised drug that has an effect on nitric oxide vasodilation? Hmm? You've surely seen commercials for it. They used to have these kind of vague hints about men throwing uh, footballs through tire swings or uh, two-footed bathtubs on the beach together. Now they just have these women that come out and say, my man's got erectile dysfunction. Viagra will stimulate vasodilation, um, specifically in the erectile tissue of the penis. Um, it's affecting nitric oxide which is this gaseous hormone-like signal that I'm pretty sure endothelial cells release and it causes vasodilation. Um, if you watch those commercials closely, they'll say don't take this drug with other nitrates. Okay. A nitrate is a drug that's a, a precursor for nitric oxide. And uh, Viagra or Cialis is the other one. That's the footed bathtub on the beach commercial. Um, they're nitrate drugs. Yeah. So bodybuilders, they use nitric oxide to look more like um, uh, pumped and vascular. Kind of okay. Thing. That's what they use for if they have any like 
athletic. Yeah, athletic advantages other than just looking vascular. I don't know if it can be used to, I don't know if enhanced performance is the right way to put it in terms of uh, muscle building. Uh, but it will increase blood flow, which if uh, a professional weightlifter takes it right before performance, um, then there's going to be more blood in the blood in the muscles, and they'll just be bigger because of the increase in fluid, which will um, make it look like they have bigger muscles. But I don't know that it's necessarily going to do anything for the skeletal muscle <coughs> function. It's possible it could because it's also going to get more oxygen to the muscle if they're lifting weights they need as much ATP to do that and so more oxygen can help but uh, to take a nitrate drug like Viagra for that purpose uh, is probably not going to do a whole lot for actual <laughs> muscle mass and uh, increase so much as just the appearance of the muscles at the time that you're uh, performing in a, a weightlifting competition or something like that that's my guess I don't know for sure so, um, yeah, Viagra and Cialis are the two drugs that advertise for uh, erectile dysfunction, and they are nitrate drugs that increase uh, vasodilation. Um, and nitrates that you need to be sure not to be taking at the same time are other drugs that do the same thing. Probably the most common other type of nitrate drug out there is nitroglycerin, um, which is taken usually for chest pain. Um, <coughs> And what's going on there is if your coronary arteries are constricted or blocked by uh, cholesterol or whatever, then you'll feel chest pain just as the heart muscle is being deprived of oxygen. And so you take nitroglycerin, usually I think the way it's administered, just put a pill underneath the tongue and it dissolves. And so the nitrate part of nitroglycerin is a substrate to make more nitro, uh, nitric oxide, uh, which can dilate the coronary vessels. Now, uh, Viagra and Cialis target uh, the erectile tissue in the penis. Nitroglycerin targets um, coronary arteries. How exactly they know which type of artery to go for, I don't know. Um, and um, I used to think, and it's been since i figured out that it's not true, but I used to think that what it was is some guy with chest pain took nitroglycerin and said, hey, look what this does. I bet I can make a bunch of money uh, and sell it to guys that have erectile dysfunction. That I thought was a story. Actually, the movie with, um, oh shoot, who was it? Uh, there is a movie about um, a guy that's a drug rep and selling Viagra when it first came out. Sorry? Still love my wife. I don't know. I don't remember what it's called, but uh, they, uh, it's basically this drug rep who's uh, trying to, you know, make money selling drugs for a pharmaceutical company, but uh, he's like new to the business and the older salespeople won't let him sell the popular drugs that he can get a lot of money. Uh, helping sell. And so he jumps on the bandwagon of when Viagra first comes out and he becomes very successful as a drugs rep because Viagra becomes a very successful drug. And in that movie, they actually do explain how Viagra was discovered, the story behind it. And it's not some old white guy with chest pains that said, hey, look, when I take this for my heart pain, I also have this thing happen, which is what I thought the story was originally. Uh, but there is a relationship between the two drugs because they both cause nitric oxide to stimulate um, vasodilation. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, the two types of vessels, arteries and veins, have the same three layers. The difference is arteries have elastic tissue. So they have an internal and external elastic membrane. Uh, the internal membrane is part of the tunica insula, the external membrane as part of the tunica um, Veins don't have that. So I've cut off part of the picture here, um, and we can't see the labels for the vein, but it's basically the same thing, except that it doesn't have the elastic stuff to it. Okay. Um, um, and the, 
I don't know if it's terribly significant, but they don't have a nervi vasorum depicted in the vein, uh, which makes sense because most of our nervous system control of blood pressure is directed at controlling arteries and not veins. So that couldn't entirely be it. But actually, there is a little yellow dot right here, which would be uh, nervous tissue. So that suggests it probably is there. They just didn't label it in the picture. Um, but So all of the labels that we see down the middle of this picture, which are pointing at the uh, artery, apply to the vein as well, except for the internal and external elastic membrane. Those are only found in the artery. Um, and then uh, I showed this part of the figure. I know yesterday in lab. Did I show it to the Monday people too? Okay. And then for both classes, I also showed you a, um, a micrograph. I mean, a microscope slide out of the slide box that we have. Just showing the differences there. Um, and I also pointed out in this picture from the book that you can see the inner surface of the artery here, as it's depicted in the drawing up there. It's kind of scrunched up while the inner surface of the vein uh, is much smoother. That's from the elastic tissue. The elastic tissue is kind of scrunching in and making the uh, endothelium take on that appearance in the artery so that when the artery does stretch out, when blood pressure is high enough to push back against the elastic tissue, um, the endothelium can flatten out and stretch. So that the sort of scrunching we see here in the empty artery is just the endothelium uh, <clears throat> wrinkled up a little bit so that it can stretch out uh, when the artery stretches with the elastic tissue. So, so this table just sort of defines the three tunics that I just mentioned, and it's written out here. Now, arteries actually come in a few different types. So what I just said about arteries uh, is true for all three types. It just, the particulars are a little bit different. One type of artery is called an elastic artery. And it's called that because it has a lot of elastic tissue in it. Um, these arteries are more about uh, stretching out and coming back to the original shape more than the muscle tissue um, uh, <coughs> causing constriction so much. Uh, elastic arteries don't tend to constrict. Uh, elastic arteries are also sometimes called conducting arteries because they conduct uh, blood along. They just are conduits for blood to flow through. And they're basically the largest arteries. So the aorta and some of the big arteries that, are, that branch off of that are elastic arteries and the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries. Um, so they're more about stretching out. And for the aorta, when the heart pumps and 130 milliliters of blood is suddenly ejected into uh, the aorta in 200 milliseconds time, the elastic tissue stretches out really quickly to accept that. And then it snaps back to its original size. The aortic, art, uh, the aortic valve should be closed so the blood can't go back from the heart. So rather, as the elastic tissue snaps back, it helps to push the blood or conduct the blood on into the rest of the circulation. The next type is called a muscular artery. And the point here is that there's less elastic tissue. There is elastic tissue, but it's not as important. And the muscle of the tunic media is very important for constricting the blood vessels. Muscular arteries are also called distributing arteries because they distribute the blood around the the body. When a vessel constricts, narrows out, it's harder for blood to flow through that artery. And so blood will tend to distribute to other wider arteries. So if we want blood to go to um, our skin because we're hot, then uh, muscular arteries going to the skin will uh, not constrict and they'll be dilated so that blood can flow to the skin. When we're cold and we want to the blood to go elsewhere, muscular arteries going to the skin will constrict and limit blood flow to our skin and distribute the blood to other tissues deep in our body. And muscular arteries are really the ones that are the workhorses of uh, sending blood to the different parts of the body that need it at any given time. And then the next type is the arteriole. 
Now, in lab, I mentioned this word for the sake of uh, um, pronunciation. Uh, sometimes I use the word arterial, which is referring to arteries in general. When I say arteriole and I stress the O semi, I'm talking about this. An arteriole is a microscopic artery. Uh, it has the same layers. Uh, there's elastic tissue in the tunica intima, uh, smooth muscle in the tunica media, elastic fibers on the uh, outer part of the tunica media for the external elastic membrane, and has a tunica externa. So it's the same basic structure as an artery that we looked at before, it's just much smaller. And in the way that they've drawn these pictures, they kind of suggest that. The difference between the size of cells drawn from the elastic artery and the muscular artery is kind of uh, subtle, but elastic arteries are bigger than muscular arteries. But the size of the cells that they've drawn in for the tunica media here are obviously much larger, suggesting that this picture is at a very small scale compared to the other ones. The tunica media here is two or three cells thick, two cells thick for most of it, and then a little overlap here, uh, the tail end of the uh, third one. Whereas these are several cells thick. Um, I'm not going to sit here and count them, but they're much thicker because um, they're larger arteries. Okay, so you can kind of imagine the, the difference in scale based on how they've drawn the sizes of the cells. While each little uh, chunk of vessel wall drawn there is drawn at about the same size just for the symmetry of the picture but the scale of the three is suggests that they're different uh, relative sizes to each other <clears throat> so they define those things a little bit uh, in um, the text there and then the next thing to think about are capillaries capillaries are the blood vessels between the arterial side and the venous side of circulation. Um, and they come in different flavors. Now, before I just showed you three types of arteries, and those are three different types of arteries, or I should say um, three distinct types of arteries. As your blood's flowing through the systemic circulation, it goes through elastic arteries, and then it goes through muscular arteries, and then it goes through arterioles. Then it gets to capillaries. Now there are three flavors of capillaries, but they're not necessarily all there together. In a particular capillary bed, there might be only one type of capillary present. Okay. And the three types are classified basically on how leaky they are, or how leaky they aren't. So with the leakiness uh, scale, we're starting at this end and moving across. So there's more uh, space for things to leak out of the capillaries on this side. And then this capillary does not allow much leakage at all. And so that capillary that doesn't allow much leakage at all is called a continuous capillary. Um, and the endothelial cells, the simple squamous epithelium lining it, uh, which is essentially just the tunic intima, and capillaries don't have a media or an external. Um, the cells are very, very closely packed together, and there's a very tight intercellular cleft, so that very little can leak out. Only really um, water molecules and uh, electrolytes, ions, can make it through there, but larger molecules can't really get through that. And then beyond the endothelium, there's connective tissue surrounding it, uh, called the basement membrane. It's a mesh, essentially just of collagen fibers, with a couple of fibroblasts scattered around here and there, probably. But um, as a mesh of collagen fibers, it acts as another sort of barrier that things can't get through very easily. Uh, kind of like a strainer as you're, you know, draining your spaghetti. Or something like that. Only things that can get through the gaps within the collagen mesh can move through the. Basically. The next type of capillary is called a fenestrated capillary. The word fenestrate or fenestre, fenestre, fenestre whatever, means window right, in Latin. 
So there are little gaps, little windows in the cells here, making them a little uh, leakier. So anything that's small enough to fit through one of these little pores can get out of, uh, get through the endothelium. Um, but there's still a continuous basement membrane around this, so the collagen uh, fiber mesh around that still will limit what can get through easily. Um, now, uh, the last type here, some sources will even kind of leave it out as a type of capillary because it's so leaky that it's almost like there's no capillary present. Um, they're called sinusoidal capillaries. The intercellular clefts have big gaps in them, so things can move through quite easily. And the, mem the base of the membrane has big gaps in it also, so things can move through that. We will find these different types of capillaries in different locations. Um, the sinusoidal capillaries are found in organs that tend to filter blood and um, have a lot of blood in them. So the spleen and the liver are the main places where we see sinusoidal capillaries. Now, as I set that up, I said organs that filter the blood, and you probably said, oh, well, the kidneys, obviously, is going to be in that list, too, but it's not true. Kidneys have fenestrated capillaries because kidneys are very careful about what they filter out of the blood. Um, the liver and spleen want to filter out even red blood cells. Old red blood cells can be filtered out of the blood by the spleen and the liver, so they want big gaps for red blood cells to move through. You don't want blood cells to be filtered out in the kidney. You only want to filter out uh, small molecules that are waste or that sort of thing. So those there's fenestrated capillaries in the kidney. Um, and then places where you need a very tight control over what moves in and out of the blood, you're going to find continuous capillaries. Um, yes? So if someone has blood in their urine, is that because their kidneys were filtered out blood cells? That means that there's some, th some bleeding in the kidney. Um, blood in the urine might very well be bleeding in the, the bladder, too. Uh, bloody urine is, is often an indicator that there might be a problem like bladder cancer or something like that. So just because it's in the urine doesn't mean it's coming from the kidneys. There's a whole lot more to the urinary system. But. So continuous capillaries are places where we have um, a tight control over what crosses in and out of the blood. Can you think of an example of an organ that has that kind of control over the blood? Uh, no. No. Brain. Blood, brain, barrier. Okay. Um, so we're going to see continuous capillaries in the brain, definitely. Now, for the heart and the, the lungs, as it just came up, I actually don't know specifically. I would guess... Those are more likely to be fenestrated, but they might very well be continuous also. Um, interesting side note, and I'm not trying to make any kind of statement about this, but does anybody know the one other major organ in the body that also has a blood barrier like the brain does? Testicles, testes. So the brain and the testes both have the same kind of relationship with the blood. What other relationships there are between those two organs, I don't want to get into here. But uh, for the sake of the testes, what it is is you don't want to introduce things that could potentially interfere with sperm production and therefore mutate uh, the germline. So it's very tight. There's not the same sort of thing in the ovaries because ovary cell production happens differently in development. But... Sperm production is happening all the time, so there's a barrier there. So there will be continuous capillaries uh, in the brain, blood-brain barrier, and in the testes for the te uh, blood-testes barrier, too. So, um, so obviously, we're only partway through the, the vessels. We're going to get to looking at what veins are next time. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about how blood flow works and how it's regulated. Now, uh, next week, to remind everybody, I'm canceling labs next week. So no Monday lab, no Wednesday lab. Um, I had to do that for Wednesday because I had a conflict, but because of the little mess up I made in the schedule, uh, both Monday and Wednesday were canceled.
Um, and then you're going to have your um, practical the week after spring break. So um, have a fun time well, studying for that. And feel free to contact me if you have questions in the interim.